The route of the 2023 Giro d'Italia has been presented, and in this video, I'll be going through it in great detail. First up, the headlines. A start in Costa de Trabocchi in Abruzzo, finish in Rome three weeks and 21 stages later. Three individual time trials, one of them being the most brutal mountain time trial I have ever seen. Seven summit finishes, seven peaks over 2,000 meters of altitude, four five-star stages, three of which come in the final week, three stages with over 5,000 meters of climbing, and 11 of the 18 road stages over 190 kilometers in distance. So in total, it's 3,450 kilometers long, with just over 51,000 meters of climbing, over 4,000 meters more than this year's edition. So, is it a classic Giro? Well, before I delve into the finer details, a quick reminder that GCN Plus will once again have live coverage of every single kilometer of the race next year, from the 6th to the 28th of May, 2023. And we have that coverage worldwide, including New Zealand. We will be back with our daily show, The Breakaway, before and after every single stage, as well as a host of other features around the event. It may be almost seven months away still, but I already can't wait for the start. Uh, but let's start with the start then. Uh, we already knew about the Grande Partenza, which takes place in Abruzzo for the second time in the Giro d'Italia's history. The race will start on May the 6th with an individual time trial of 18.4 kilometers on the Costa dei Trabocchi, almost entirely along a cycle path. Uh, it's one of three individual time trials this year, which many think is to try and entice Remco Evenepoel to the race. Uh, they should also serve to force the climbers to attack earlier in the race, rather than wait until the final mountain stage as we saw this year. Stage two, from Teramo to San Salvo, looks to be one for the sprinters in the peloton. There is a notoriously tough climb to the town of Chieti, but with that coming at 80 kilometers to go, it's unlikely it's going to spoil the fun for the sprinters. The race heads out of Abruzzo during stage three on what starts out as a flat day, heading up to and along the Adriatic coastline. This one, however, is unlikely to be one for the sprinters. With a little over 40 kilometers to go, they start climbing from the lakes of Monticchio, 6.6 k's at 6.4%, followed quickly by another shorter climb before a fast downhill run into the finish in Melfi. Could be one for the break, could be one for the fastest finishers who can get over the climbs. Now the first really hard finish though comes a day later on stage four, which starts in Venosa and finishes at Lago Laceno. Now it's been used three times before at the race, the last of those being in 2012. Now it climbs nine kilometers long with a section near the top of two and a half kilometers, which has constant double digit gradients. What could make it tougher are the three climbs that precede the one to the finish. It's not a brutal day, but with three and a half thousand meters of climbing, it's certainly tough enough for the fourth stage of a Grand Tour. Now the tactics there could also be interesting because there's just over four kilometers of flat road between the top of that last climb and the finish line. Stage five should also be for the sprinters, although they will have to work for it that day. Uh, it starts in Atripalda in Campania. Uh, the first half is on lumpy terrain and will take the race to its most southerly point of the 2023 route. The second half is predominantly downhill and will lead them to the finish line in Salerno. 24 hours later, they will be in Napoli for a circuit race. Now, many of you will remember Thomas de Gent's brilliant win there this year. The Belgian formed part of a large group early in the stage, and he later outpowered and outwitted everybody else to take a memorable win. However, unlike this year, there is just one big circuit starting and finishing in Napoli, rather than the multiple laps that they did this year. There are two climbs, but with the second of them a long way from the finish line, I would predict a bunch sprint that day. Uh, it's also the shortest road stage of the entire route in 2023, at 156 kilometers. On Friday the 12th of May, the race will return to the Abruzzo region for the first big mountaintop finish of the race. It's the Grand Sasso d'Italia, last used in 2018, where Simon Yates outsprinted Thibaut Pino to the line. At over 200 kilometers in distance and with almost 4,000 meters of elevation gain, this is going to be a really big test for the first week of the Giro. The climb to the finish, 26 kilometers long, but only the final five kilometers are particularly tough, averaging over 8%. The eighth stage marks the start of the second weekend of racing, and it's another long day in the saddle. 207 kilometers from Terni to Fossombroni in the Marche region. This is one of the stages that I most like the look of when it comes to the profile, because there's two laps of a circuit that take in the short but steep Cappuccini climb, which is 2.1 kilometers at over 10% average gradient. 
My view for a long time has been that these shorter efforts, which allow riders to get deep into the red, can often be the ones that create the biggest time gaps and the biggest surprises amongst the GC contenders. Now, that particular climb was used at Torino Adriatico in 2019, and that was a corker of a stage. The difference with this one is that between the two ascents of the Cappuccini, there's a longer climb up to Monte della Cesani, known locally as Il Piccolo Mortirolo due to its steep gradients of up to 20%. So three steep climbs back to back in the finale of that stage, there are definitely going to be fireworks. And to round up the first nine days of racing ahead of the first of two rest days next year, we have the second of the individual time trials. This one is in Cesena in the Romagna region, and whilst almost pan flat, it is quite long by modern standards at 33.6 kilometers. If Avonapol does start the race, that is where he'll look to take a lot of time out of his key rivals. We resume after the first rest day on Tuesday the 16th of May with stage 10, which looks to be a day for me for the breakaway. Starting in Scandiano in Emilia Romagna and heading westwards for a finish in Viareggio on the coastline of Tuscany. Whether or not the breakaway succeeds that day will depend on whether or not a Mass Pedersen type of rider is at the race. If he is, it's got his name written all over it. Uh, we have a similar story on stage 11, which starts a little further up the coastline in Camaiore, heading to Tortona. At 218 kilometers, it's the equal longest stage of the race. Uh, the three ascents are not particularly difficult, but might be a little too much for the sprinters. We shall see. And there are more medium mountains on the menu for stage 12 between Bra and Rivoli. That definitely looks like one for the breakaway for me. On to stage 13, and that's where the race hits the Alps, and actually the highest point of next year's race. That means that the Cima copy of the 2023 Giro d'Italia is the Col de Grand Saint Bernard uh, on the border between Italy and Switzerland. That's 2,469 metres above sea level. It's a climb that was last used at a Grand Tour at the 2009 Tour de France, and it is certainly a beast. 34 kilometers at just over 5% average gradient. That would be an entire day out for me right now, but the rides will then cross into Switzerland and descend for around 35 kilometers before tackling the Croix de Cour, which is 15 kilometers at 8.8%. Now, what's interesting about this is that According to my own research, the paved road stops at Verbier, but the profile shows it getting a good few hundred meters in altitude after Verbier. I'll need to look into that one a little bit more, but we might have some gravel there. And they're not even done then. Another long descent leads them to a summit finish at Crans Montagna. On the profile, it looks quite small, and it is small compared to the previous climbs, but at 16 kilometers and 7.2% average gradient, it is not to be sniffed at. Uh, it's the first stage of the race with over 5,000 metres of climbing and it will no doubt reshape the general classification. Stage 14 is a real pig for the sprinters. It's got a flat second half, but soon after the start in Sierre, Switzerland, the climb up over the Simplon Pass goes to 2,000 metres above sea level. Now, given the profile afterwards, it's unlikely we'll see much GC action. So again, that one has breakaway written all over it. To round out the second week of racing, it's a tough looking stage to Bergamo. No high mountains, but a lot of consistent undulations. Got four categorized climbs and 3,600 meters of ascent over 191 kilometers. And I wonder whether this one might be similar to the Torino stage from this year, where Bora Hans go really rip the race apart. After the second and final rest day, the race resumes in Savio Chiesi in Trentino for stage 16. Uh, there's a little bit of flat at the start of the day to get the legs warmed up with views across Lake Garda, but then it's straight into four back-to-back -back climbs. Uh, none of them are excessively long, nor do they go much above 1,500 meters, but this is another really gruelling day in the saddle. It finishes atop Monte Bondone, a mountain in the Trentino region, 21.4 kilometers at 6.7%, and it's the first time that climb's been used at the race as a summit finish since 2006. Stage 17 will be the last chance for the sprinters until the final day of the race, and one of only two stages given a one-star rating. It's still quite a long one at 192 kilometers, but most of the day is either flat or downhill en route to Caiole on the coast near Venice. And then it is on to a trio of back-to-back -back stages in the high mountains. Stage 18 is another big one with four classified climbs, culminating with the Val di Zoldo at the end of 160 kilometers. Now it's a climb that hasn't been used at the race since 2005, where Paolo Salvadelli took the stage honors. Ahead of it though, is the Koi climb, six kilometers at just under 10% average gradient, and with a maximum of 19%. 
on to stage 19, which is one of, if not the queen stage of next year's race. Four humongous climbs, the Paso Campolongo, Paso Valparolo, the fearsome Paso Jao, and then the highest summit finish of the entire race at Trecimi di Lavaredo. 2,304 meters above sea level, that one. In total, there's 5,400 meters of climbing over the 182 kilometer stage, which starts in Longaroni. Now, it's been nine years since we saw a summit finish at Trecimi di Lavaredo, and the riders will be hoping for better weather conditions this time around. In 2013, Vincenzo Nibali won the stage and officially declared himself the winner of the Giro d'Italia in some of the most epic weather conditions of recent times. Uh, that year, there was far less climbing on routes to the final ascent. The stage next year is going to be an epic no matter what the weather. Stage 20 is the penultimate day of the race, and it's the third of the individual time trials. Only this one has a key difference. It finishes up a pretty big mountain. And not just any old mountain, it's the Monte Lussari in Talvisio Udine, a climb never before used at the Giro d'Italia, but at 7.8 kilometers long and 11.8% average gradient, you wonder why. And those stats do not tell the full story. The first five kilometers of this climb average over 15%, absolutely bonkers. And our 10 kilometers ahead of that climb on a flat road, it's gonna be a really tough stage, particularly with what has come the day and the week leading up to it. I think we could see some real surprises there. You might be the best time trial and climber on paper, but that might not mean anything at this point of the Giro d'Italia, particularly with a stage profile like that. Absolutely brutal. Either way, if the general classification isn't already wrapped up by that point, it will be after that stage. Now, what could be interesting to the bike nerds out there is whether or not the riders decide to change their bikes on the climb, whether they start on a road bike with time trial bars. Now, if you fancy heading out there to watch that particular stage, it definitely looks worth it. The views from the top are absolutely incredible, and you can get to the top in 15 minutes in a cable car from Tarvisio for 14 euros. Right, uh, Monte Lussara is on the extreme northeastern tip of Italy, close to the Austrian and Slovenian borders, and so the rumoured stage 21 finish in Trieste made a lot of sense because it's only 150 kilometres away. Instead, though, the 21st and final stage is going to be in Rome, 600 kilometres further south, meaning a large and far from environmentally friendly transfer for the riders and the race entourage. It really does feel like Pro Cycle needs to take a long, hard look at itself at some point, sooner rather than later, preferably, when it comes to its carbon footprint. That final stage in Rome is the only reason the sprinters at the race will want to haul their bodies over all the mountains of the final week. It's 115 kilometers in length and almost completely flat, so it'll almost certainly be a ceremonious ride for whoever's in the pink jersey and one final chance for the sprinters left in the race to shine. So that is the route for the 2023 Giro d'Italia. Initial thoughts on first look is that there's a definite omission of a lot of the famous climbs. So no Stelvio, no Gavio, no Motorola, no Finestre, no Zoncola, etc., etc. That said, there is an awful lot of climbing. And I feel like it's quite a well-balanced route. Who does it suit? Well, if you're looking at the time trials, you've got to say Remco Evenepoel. However, these three weeks of the Giro d'Italia are far harder than those of the Welter this year, so it could be a completely different story. Primoz Roglic is another rider who will like the look of the time trials, even if a mountain time trial on the penultimate day might bring back some painful memories. Uh, if the thought of co-leadership with Vinegar at the Tour de France doesn't whet his appetite, we may well see him on the start line in Abruzzo. Reigning champion Jai Hindley won't be relishing the flat time trials, the two of those, but shouldn't have anything to worry about when it comes to the mountain time trial. Geraint Thomas is another possibility. Uh, it's recently been rumoured that he won't be at the Tour de France next year. One last hurrah at the Giro d'Italia, perhaps. For the rest, we're just going to have to wait and see what the race programmes are for the big stars. Vinegar and Bogaccia seem certain to concentrate on the Tour de France again next year, although you never know your luck. One big question that I've been pondering is, where do Italian hopes lie? With the retirement of Vincenzo Nibali, they really don't have anyone with a hope of a top five, let alone the pink jersey in Rome. But I really hope they find a new GC talent soon. The Tifosi need a campionissimo to cheer for. Right, let me know your thoughts on this route and the rides it suits in the comments section down below. Which stages are you most looking forward to? Got to say, that one in Tuscany is the one for me with the really steep gradients. I look forward to hearing and reading your thoughts and I'll see you all again soon.